it doesn't sound like you um, use a permission based opener. What are your thoughts on permission based openers? <laughs> the hot take. Uh, I don't like them. Uh, I don't know. I am not a fan. I, I don't think so because the person picking up the phone is giving you that permission, right? Because it is a choice. They either get to hang up or decline or not pick it up, right? But if that person picks up, they've already authorized that they have that moment. So why waste it trying to verify that again, right? Um, even though, you know, a few of uh, people do like, you know, hey, is it cool if we roll the dice and I give, you know, I can have 30 seconds to tell you why I called or, hey, can I have 27 seconds to tell you why I called or, hey, did I catch you before you went into that meeting? You know, do you have a moment? I just... I think they're very respectful and I get it. And I do think that in a certain scenario, again, picking up an experience, you start to look at your cues when the person answers the phone to where I'm not saying I don't use them, but again, I don't, you've answered the phone. I'm just like, Hey, Jason, it's Tom. Uh, just wanted to tell you why I was calling because that's all you care about. You, the first three things that you're trying to do in that 30 seconds with this call is who is it? How do I know them? And do, should we continue this conversation? You do it with your friends, you do it with your family, you do it with all the calls you answer. So I try to get right to that and then we'll dive into the, you know, now that you know that stuff, may I have to, you know, may I have a moment to tell you. Um, so I'm not a big fan of permission based. Um, I think, you know, you get it by them picking up the phone. Um, and so just get into it. Unless like you can tell in the scenario they're on a plane or something um, or in a large crowd, right? I'm not going to say I've never said it. You know, if I picked you up and it was super noisy, I'm like, hey, Jay, it's Tom. Uh, sounds like I caught you at a bad minute. Are you all right? And you're like, oh, no, I'm just, you know, running through this, this subway real quick. Oh, okay. Do you have a second? And I can tell you why I called. Right? That's fair. But just a cold call all day asking everybody for their time or do they have permission to hear you out? Why would you pick up the phone? <laughs> you already are planning to interrupt them. So you did. Right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have picked up the phone. You would have emailed me and said, hey, mind if I call you in five minutes? Are you around? So it's always a treat for me anytime I get to talk to someone about you know, cold calling, especially, you know, someone that's been doing it for a little while. And I think that one of the the things you hear a lot these days is like the different types of calls, right? A cold call versus a, a warm call and, you know, all of that stuff. We're going to dig into the nuance of, you know, warm calling. So how to kind of warm up, you know, some of your calls and not make it feel so cold. And before we get into that, my name is Jason Bay. You can call me Jay Bay. Appreciate you checking out the Blissful Prospecting Podcast. Uh, this show's for Reps, sales leaders who want to turn complete strangers into paying customers. And today we're talking to Tom Slocum. He's VP of sales at Trainio. And we're going to talk about how to go from cold to warm calling. We're going to talk about the power of slowing down, how you don't need to always secure a next step, and how you can lead with confidence versus fear. Uh, Tom, it's good to have you on. Hey, hey. So excited to be here. Thanks for having me. My favorite topic. You know it. Cold calling. Or warm calling as we yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's dude, let's talk about your first cold calling job. Was it I think we talked about was it your job at Discover Finance? Was that your first cold calling job or was it something else? That was it. No, that was it. Um, you know, I was a grocery bagger before then, working at Subway as a sandwich artist, right? Super cool title they'd give you. <laughs> um, my mother, my stepmom was a uh, customer service rep or a CSM for Discover Card for like 20 years at this point. Um, and so she had gotten me an opportunity to jump into Discover Card, make a little bit more money, kind of get this chance. And I was like, I'm all in. Um, and so, yeah, I dove into uh, Discover Card all the way back in 2007. Whew, crazy. Wow. Yeah, that was a, a while ago, man. The uh, I think my first sales job was in 2008, like, you know, 19 years old, going door to door, selling house painting services, you know. So what was that? Did you know that you were going to be cold calling, by the way? Did they tell you that? Or was it one of those kind of jobs where you're like, oh, okay, I guess I'm going to be cold calling. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So it was a little tricky because I got moved into the job I got after. So they make you go through a month of training before you ever make a dial or do anything. It's a four week training, um, which I thought was crazy, right? You don't even see a, a return from these people until you know eight weeks, 12 weeks in because you've got a full month of training, yep. right? Uh, but I was in the balance transfer department. And so I thought it was inbound or warm stuff. Uh, and then, yeah, I got in and it was like, no, you have to outbound cold, you know, people, here's your list of customers, right? And you want to get them to move their cards. And I was like, oh, snap. So I had to cold, cold call people, right? And, or, you know, it was kind of warm because they were already clients of Discover Card. 
But hey, Jason, you know, are you interested in moving your balance off of your credit card at a 0% APR, right? Um, and trying to convince somebody to pull or have conversations around six figure, you know, balance moves when I'm 18, 17 years old, trying to talk about transferring a $25,000 credit card debt over to another card um, and having to do that. So yeah, yeah, it was, I thought it was going to be warm, uh, but it opened up as, you know, I had to go outbound to these people uh, through a dialer and all of that good stuff. Yeah. So you're sitting in front of the computer with a predictive dialer and it wasn't one of those where you hear a little click. You don't even hear the person say hello because it's going no. so fast. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, we were just in cubicles, man. We were just in cubicles on a floor, yeah. uh, hanging out. Everybody worked in a little station. You had your cool little headset with the old school phone, and the uh, the UI or the interface was like so like back in the '90s with like it was green and black and just words, and you had to read through it. Um, and so you didn't have much on this person, right? And then you would just try to pitch them moving any cards that they had. Um, so it was a lot of discovery. That's how I learned discovery because we were cold calling them and we didn't know if they had other credit cards. We knew they were a discover card customer, but who knows what they had, right? So you had to discover that and try to talk to people about their balances on their credit cards and what their highest one was that they were sitting on uh, as an 18 year old, you know, trying to ask people like, hey, what's your highest credit card? And they're like, dude, what? Um, so it was interesting uh, having one manager, right? The old school way of I purely had a manager, no leader. Just somebody that kind of made sure the kids didn't get rowdy in the daycare center, right? Just there to keep it, you know, just in-house, uh, but no true personal development or anything. Uh, but I slayed it. It was a fun job um, and just a fun experience to learn about an auto dialer and just throwing a net out and hoping you got, you know, some business during the day. Yeah, I feel like one of the best things that you can do if you want to get into sales which a lot of people end up getting into sales by accident, but to work in a call center like that, the amount of volume of conversations that you have when you're on a dialer, it's because I come from call centers. And what I always tell people is, you know, imagine you hang up the phone and then 30 seconds later, you're connected live with another person. I mean, imagine how many freaking conversations you're having every day. It is insane. You know, what's one thing that you, because it's sort it sounds like you had to learn this sort of through the school of hard knocks, like, you weren't given a lot of direction. What's one thing you picked up during that time that has been helpful for, you know, B2B, you know, kind of cold calling the stuff that you're doing more now these days, what, what was something helpful that you picked up during that time or learned? Resilience and rejection, because like you said, you dealt with so many conversations. Um, you know, I'm making 300 to 400 dials a day on this thing. Uh, you know, going two straight hours and having 200 dials, right. And having to like, log out of the queue just to take a breather and be like, I got to go walk. Like this is aggressive, yeah. um, you know, cause you're just like, holy cow, I just did all the, you know, it was just going, um, you know, but it was a rejection, right? Because you dealt with so much of it at such a high volume that my first few months, I, I, I had a hard time. I struggled. I didn't know if it was a job for me. My, my stepmom worked right downstairs and I would try to connect with her. Um, and I struggled. And uh, I just had to learn rejection because I'm competitive. I was just playing high school football. I was playing varsity football. I had all the, the high emotion of just being this competitive kid with a know-it-all that when I went into these calls, I just thought everything just happened. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is easy. I just call, they say yes, and it's good to go. And it's like, no, <laughs> it doesn't work. And so my calls would get tend to be aggressive. I would be impatient. Um, and again, you're dealing with such a high volume. So I just really learned rejection at such a fast rate um, because I worked there for almost a year, year and a half. And at 300 dials, 400 dials a day, you know, talking to all these people, I had a real opportunity to get through that quickly. Um, And I come from call centers too. That was a lot of what I did in the beginning of my career. And I think it's definitely for that, just to excel your career so much faster uh, in dealing with rejection and outreach at a high rate. Yeah, let's, let's talk about rejection. I don't know, in the work that you've done, because you've done a variety of things over the years, how have you seen fear of rejection affect the reps around you and the reps that you've led their ability to be effective on the phone? It's the worst to be crippled by it. Um, You know, I've had a lot of reps personally that I've managed really struggle with it. And then just friends or people that I worked with, right, that they were terrified to pick up the phone. Uh, They were very timid on the phone. They were assuming... The other person had control, 
And then you had the other half of the group with the, that was just bosses, right? They got on the phone. They were resilient. They were hustlers. They were smooth talking, slick salespeople. And you're just like, you know, oozing at every word that came out of their mouth. Um, and you could just tell that it was this, this fear of being an inconvenience or an interruption. Um, and then in the call center, you know, you ask some weird questions versus like B2B and stuff. I'm sure in your repertoire of careers, you've had to ask some really weird questions. I used to sell solar water heaters and have to call people and ask them what their credit score was on a cold call. Like what, yeah. you know, middle of dinner, five o'clock, like, Hey, Jason, you, you know, you thinking about a solar water heater. What's your credit score? Um, and you're like, what the heck, <laughs> you know? And, uh, so like you get those uncomfortable questions, but fear is what cripples everybody, yeah. especially even today's landscape. You don't see a lot of SDRs picking up the phone right now. You have companies putting all their marbles into social selling or email and saying that cold calling is dead and it doesn't work. It's an ineffective yeah. channel. Huh? It's insane. I, it's, I was just talking to a company that we might start working with here soon, hopefully. And they're like, yeah, the cold calling is a part of your, your training program. We don't do any of that right now. Yeah. Is like, are we missing the boat? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. You are. are you kidding? You like, should at least be calling or engaging with your emails. Period. At the very, the, very least. At the very least, yeah. Like at least go the inbound route or the warm lead. But it should be a part of your repertoire. But if you're only doing email and social selling, you are just crippling yourself because you're assuming that your audience is on those channels and some aren't. You know, I, I think you just have to hit the channels whether they're effective or not, just because it's going where your audience lives, right? Um, so I think fear of getting on that phone is just so crippling. Um, and then it leads into the way your calls go. You will get run over. I was getting run over in the beginning when I was first cold calling because again, I had to get over the mental aspect that I didn't know what $25,000 in credit debt was like. I didn't know what having these balances were like. I couldn't speak to it. And I dealt with a lot of people coming at me for that being like, dude, you're some kid in the call center. Don't like, I'm good. Right. Or being very rude because you're getting into finance. So it would get me, I wouldn't come excited to come to work the next day. I'd be like, I don't want to pick up the phone. You know, can I reach out any other way? And LinkedIn didn't exist like that. And that, you know, in 2007 or email wasn't as big like that. Right. So all we did was cold call. There was no other multi-channel. We, we just cold called every day. So rejection just plays a big part and you have to overcome that and know that just people are people. Get on the phone. It's the fastest speed to information you can ever get, you know, rather than play the back and forth email game for four, six touches. I can call Jason right away. And if he picks up 10 minutes, me and him are done. That's closed. That's a wrap. We know what we both want and we can proceed versus 16, six email touches over 12 days. You want to wait 12 days to get somebody? They probably went with four other competitors by then because that other rep picked up the phone and was willing to have that conversation. Yeah. It's being willing to, I think, be uncomfortable. Being willing yeah. to put yourself in a situation where you could be embarrassed or get rejected. It, it's the willingness. It's the courage to put yourself into a situation where the odds are against you. Mm -hmm. The best cold callers, at least in my experience, 30, 40%, maybe their connects, they'll, they'll book into a meeting. That's, that's extremely high. Yeah. So statistically over half the time you're going to fail. It's the people willing to put themselves in that position. Um, I think, so let's, let's talk about confidence. Cause one of the things you talked about was leading with confidence versus fear. And I've been on one with confidence lately because the advice is always, yeah, be more confident. I'm like, yeah, fuck dude. If it was that easy, it's, everyone would just be more confident. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I want more confidence too, you know, but I'm curious your take on how do you think about confidence and how does one improve their confidence? So I was going to mention a few seconds ago, and this is a great segue is what really changed for me at discover card and got me to, to do everything is most trainings that we went through or that you go through, they don't give you the full cycle of how it plays out. Right. So you, what was hard for me is I didn't know what to expect with these calls. Literally every call could have been at random. I didn't know. It wasn't like, like you said, if every call was great, we'd all do it. Right. If it was all yeses. So what changed for me was when I had a peer see my frustrations and say, Hey, let me role play it out with you. Let's like, let's, let's work on this for a few weeks. Like, what are you running into often? You know, why are you having such a hard time? And man, I tell you, the moment we started role-playing it out and she could hear how I was doing it um, and she started helping me, 
Uh, her name was Princess. I still remember her to this day. She was the best cube mate. Uh, we called them cube mates back in the day, right? In the cube. Uh, and she took really, really good care of me. She was the first to uh, give a shit, right? And say, hey, you're failing. Because like I said, our managers were just bullpens, right? They were just managers. So once we got to actually play out the scenario all the way through of what the call should look like, she ran me through some scenarios. She played them out on how she seemed the most success. That's when I gained that confidence and I was like, oh, that's it? That's all you're trying to take them to do? I thought it was going down this route. And she was like, no. So on top of that, it was also knowing sometimes to just check in and make sure you're, you're understanding the assignment, right? You know exactly what, pe- what you're supposed to be. And don't be afraid to ask because I was doing something completely different that was causing a lot of friction. And once I asked about it or had this conversation with her, I was like, well, of course I'm running into that. I was going left when I like didn't know we were supposed to go right. And so the role playing really helped me to just play it out and then play out those scenarios. So then I got on the phones and I was like, oh, I'm prepared now. Now I get it. Now I can be you know, able to adjust. So I think role plays are really effective um, when you genuinely care and can play it out. And as a leader, be willing to break your rep, right? Like make them uncomfortable. Too many leaders go through the motions, right? Me and you could role play right now and we're just going to kind of go through it. Don't do that. Genuinely be a prospect for this person. Invest in them and play the part. Um, I used to cold call my friends and play through it and I wouldn't tell them. So one thing I used to do in getting prepped in my cold calls is I would cold call through my phone, but I wouldn't tell people I was doing it because I wanted the natural reaction. So I would block my number and see if they would pick up and I would just pitch. (laughs) And like, I'd either be like, who? And then they'd be like, oh my God, is this? They're like, wait, is it you, Tom? And I was like, it's me. And they're like, dude, you had me. I totally bought into that. Like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm just trying to practice. And I knew that if I mess this up, it's you. Like, I can get through it. Um, And so I started going through my phone book, right? And playing those wild cards out with safe people I knew that would be all right, right? Um, And then I cold called my grandmother to play it down at a fifth grade level, right? So I could feel good. And now it's so funny because these things get preached about, you know, 10 years later as a big deal, 15 years later. But it's like, Jason, we've been doing these things back before they were there. Right. But those were the tactics that you just stumble upon that you learn to gain that confidence because the, the fear is the fear of the unknown. Your fear of failing, your fear of not succeeding in something. Well, then go find out how to succeed in it. What does success look like in it? And then go chase that. Right. And get yourself there. But if you don't know what success looks like, then every call is a failure. Every situation is a failure because you don't know where you want to go. So you've got to align to that um, and then to get that confidence. Um, And then nowadays at a B2B side, you got to know your research. You got to know exactly who you're calling and why um, to get that confidence. Because again, you're just scared. You don't know who you're calling. You're winging it. It's a random Russian roulette. You know, who's going to pick up the phone? But if you generally have 50 cold calls to make in a day and you know the story on all those 50 people, then you have nothing to be afraid of. You're just talking to a human, calling up your 50 friends, hoping that five of them will tell you yes. Now, when you call 100 strangers, that's scary. (laughs) You don't know what's going to happen at 100 strangers because you could get a couple or you could get everybody to tell you to go screw yourself. So you got to do some research and feel confident um, and prepping yourself with the right ammo. That was a long-winded yeah. kind of thing, but no, I love that. There's this, you know, competence piece to increasing your confidence, right? It's, you know, what's Buckley's. my skill level? Yeah. You know, am I practicing? Right. You mentioned repetition. I think I want to double-click on something that you mentioned. I mean, you said doing an actual role play, and you know, one of the things that I've been harping on with the teams that I work with is because you know, the training I do is typically very workshop style, so it's yeah. Hey, if we're talking cold calling, I might spend 15 or 20 minutes training around the intro and then we'll break out into breakout rooms and people will practice. And I always tell people, I want you to practice in an environment that's way harder than what it's really going to be like. So as a prospect, don't sound super happy when you pick up the phone, dude. If we're practicing objection handling, I want you to give someone like two, three objections in a row. Make it way harder than it will actually be over the phone so that when you call someone, it feels like a relief almost. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's like putting ankle think, weights on, right? You put on ankle weights and you walk around the house for an hour with 10 pound ankle weights. You take those suckers off, right? You feel like you could jump through the moon. I love that, right? Yeah. Put them in the bullpen, make weights. it hard. Huh? Do you wear ankle weights around the house, Tom? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Are you wearing them right I, now? 
I am not, but I do love them. Uh, I don't have them on, but uh, I do because I, I, that's, I, I don't have a good vertical. I'm six foot one and I can't hop. So I try to work on it because I can't get up there. <laughs> Yeah, I had to ask. I was like, "This sounds way too much like a like you." <laughs> I do it every once in a while. I do it, uh, you know, put them on. Uh, but you're right, though, because if you put yourself in that environment, right? I'm putting around 20 pounds on my feet and giving myself that that exercise of doing that. That when I take them off, man, my feet feel so relieved, right? And I'm just walking on air. Yeah. Um, and and I love that point, right? Is I think that's where people hate role playing. I hated it at most companies yeah. I went through because nobody gave a shit. Nobody actually wanted to do it. Nobody really, no leader actually said, no, stop. I know it's uncomfortable, but we got to break through that together. I'll go first, right? Let me lead into the fire. Let's role play this out, Jason, right? And we go through it. And when you show that authenticity and you're like, look, we're not perfect, right? Not every call is going to go the way we want, but let's try, right? And then when they get on the phone and they get somebody to object with like a silly, like, surface level response when they're used to going five layers deep, they're like, oh, this perfect. I can handle that. Um, and they feel much more confident being on the phone. I love it. Yeah. And you got muscle memory there and you don't, you can be more in the moment yeah. you know, when you're talking to people and have to think about, Oh God, you said not interested. What am I supposed to say? You know, it's just, I'm having a conversation, you know, let's, uh, let's get into some of the more kind of tactical, you know, parts. So one of the things you talk about a lot is the power of slowing down. So let's talk about maybe the intro of the cold call. How do you like to get the first 60 seconds of a call started? And maybe even before that intro, is there anything you might do or teach or work with reps on around how to prepare and get yourself in the right mindset, like any routines, anything like that? Like what happens five, 10 minutes before you're going to enter a cold call block? So jamming out to my Spotify. Um, I'm a big, big music person. Uh, I don't know if it's my ADHD or whatever some psychological effect is, but music is my thing, right? It, it calms me down. It puts me in a good mood. So I always get my list ready uh, that I don't have to mess with, right? I got my cold call list of good songs so I don't have to skip or mess with it. I can just put it on. Um, and then in between dials, I try to take two to three breaths uh, as the phone is ringing. I try to get two or three in. Um, and every call and it, that took practice. I didn't do that when I was like that. It's now there to have that awareness, but over time it took time, um, to just, again, don't get riled up. Don't, we have to remember, we control our emotions. Our emotions don't control us. We're originating them. There, there are body responding to something, but we have the control to slow down, let those nerves go try to flip that nervous energy into excited energy. Not, oh God, I have to make a hundred calls. I hope I can get through this. No, I get a hundred calls to make right now. I'm hoping I get to talk. I'm going to talk to 20 people for at least two minutes, right? And set little micro goals for yourself that allow you to feel good as you're progressing through the call block. Because if it's just solely put, put on meeting booked, you're going to be stressed out. Put that one off the agenda, right? Focus on some other things. You got an hour call block. What can you do in that hour? Is there a list you want to get through? Is there a certain question you want to ask five times because you're practicing it? Um, you know, put yourself micro goals. So as you're going, you feel like you're winning um, and keeping that, that confidence. But slowing down is so important because tonality is key on a call. So in the first 60 seconds, I try to be, took a lot of practice, but I try to pick up on the cues from the moment they pick up. How are they responding? Are they busy? I try to like slow down and look at or listen to the sounds of their environment. Maybe they're in a car, maybe they're in a plane. There's people all commotion around, right? Um, before I go in. Um, and then I just be very direct. I don't play gimmicks. I don't have a great, I, I do the whole, me and James Buckley were just talking about this today. You know, the reason for my call is that's mine, right? I go in with a very clean, direct, authoritative tone that I've been doing this job for a long time. I act that part that I'm booking meetings all day. I'm talking to people and I'm confident in that. And now I'm calling you to try to pitch you that same opportunity, right? So I come in, hey, Jason, it's Tom. Uh, reason I was reaching out to you is I saw your post earlier today about some cold call reluctance. I was curious how you're overcoming that up until this point, right? And I'm very clear, direct. Um, I speak it very clean and already in that, you know, my name you know, the reason for my call, and I've opened it up with a question that is relevant to you, 
that'll also show me where you are at the current buying process or what stage you are. Because I'm like, what have you done up until this point to address your call reluctance? I was just curious. You're going to open up with a few different things. And now I know where to not take my call because you've already mentioned those things. Or I know where to take my call because you've given me the avenue to take it next based on your answer. Um, so that's kind of my opener is just hitting those three bullets. I tell you, you know, at least my name, cause that's all you care about. You don't care about my company, anything. You're just like, Hey, Jason, it's Tom. I was calling, uh, because I saw your post. I, I mentioned my trigger, my tie in again, this is exactly while I'm calling you. And then I'm opening up that open-ended question so I can flip it on you for a minute because I need to catch up on my notes. I need to show you where you are in my CRM, right? I should have that info, but if not, I have a moment while you're answering that question to get myself slowed down. Okay, I have a connect. He's speaking, listening. Let's do this, right? And now I get right into it. And based on your answer, we'll pivot that pathway um, and go to that discussion. Love it. Do you have an example of something that you can think of where maybe the research is not as straightforward as that? So it's maybe something like, you know, I'm thinking I work with people that sell into like logistics and transportation. Oh yeah. And uh, people might not exactly list out their problem or whatever it might be. How, how do you think about it? Where I'm kind of going is the framework behind the statement and the question yeah. and like what you might say in different kind of situations. I don't know if my question makes sense or not, but no, no, it's, it's, it's my point about what really truly is personalization, right? When you talk about that, it's just relevancy. That's really it is. And so when I work with SDRs and I coach them just like you, right, where we find these industries where they're like, hey, I love LinkedIn, but my prospects aren't there. They're not just writing out like you sales leaders every day complaining about these tools. Like they're not those people, right? So I can't do that research like you're saying, right? Um, that's where a couple things I tell them to do is one, again, relevancy. So focus on buyer persona, bucket, bucket people right? Figure out your list from there using buyer persona. Try to find out your, your buyers, what those are, and then go find those like-minded ideal customers that you can talk to. You know, Jason, if I had nowhere to find you on, on social and I was just calling blissful prospecting and you picked up, right? It's, hey, Jason, you know, it's Tom. Uh, the reason I was reaching out is I talk to podcast, you know, hosts just like yourself every day, and usually what they find is one of these three areas is a common uh, podcast issue. A, they're this, B, this, or that. You mind, uh, you know, I was reaching out to see where you're at in that process or which one, you know, do any of those relate? And you're like, oh yeah, Tom, uh, you know, I, I have that same issue with number B. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, and that's why I wanted to reach out. I was just looking over the company profile and I thought, you know, we would have a conversation. So the reason for my calling is, and now I can open it and go into it, so you can usually just dive into the buyer persona um, if you don't have that, that research. The second piece is you already do kind of have that research internally with your own customers. Go talk to your buyers you already have, right? So I send these SDRs back to their CSMs and I say, go book a lunch with them. Go sit down for an hour and understand the clients they deal with. And from their perspective, what are the clients telling them we solve? Um, who do they look like? And learn that information and then find out why they took a meeting, right? Ask the, the CSM, you know, why did this person become a client for us? What changed for them or what have we been solving for them? Now, when I call these people at random because I don't have my research, I can't really warm them up. I can speak to them though and with them because I show them that I know their world at least. And I'm calling with purpose because you fit that mold um, or could be, right? Um, and so those are a couple of things that I do if I don't have that full ammo to be like, oh my God, I have all the ammo in the world uh, to tell me how to call. Yeah. Yeah. I teach something very similar. I call it a priority drop, you yeah. know, where it's, it's, it's kind of problem focused and aspiration focused at the same time mm -hmm. in, a, in a statement. And it's like, uh, so if I was calling you and your VP of sales, it might be, Hey, I talked to a lot of VPs of sales and I, one thing I tend to hear, I would list out a couple of things, but it's a, one of the things is that they, they really want to create a more balanced pipeline so that their account executives aren't relying so much on inbound and the BDR team to fill their pipeline. You know, something like that, where it's like they're trying to create balanced pipeline, like something aspirational and then a problem, like why they're doing it. Yes, you know, so they don't have to rely yeah. so much on that. Um, I like that approach because it kind of, it allows you to put out two or three things, depending on what you sell, of course, 
were you now know where to focus the conversation on because they just said one of these things is kind of relevant to what they're working on versus you completely guessing because your right. approach correct me if i'm wrong doesn't involve you making a pitch in that beginning part of the call you're not saying hey tom jason with blissful prospecting i was calling because we do sales training yep. in fact we have a six-week program i think your company would be perfect for you <laughs> you know what i mean right um, yeah so can you let's backtrack a bit it doesn't sound like you um, use a permission-based opener. What are your thoughts on permission-based openers? <laughs> the hot take. Uh, I don't like them. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not a fan. I I don't think so because the person picking up the phone is giving you that permission, right? Because it is a choice. They mm -hmm. either get to hang up or decline or not pick it up, right? But if that person picks up, they've already authorized that they have that moment. So why waste it trying to verify that again, right? Um, even though, you know, a few of, uh, people do like, you know, Hey, is it cool if we roll the dice and I give, you know, I can have 30 seconds to tell you why I called or, Hey, can I have 27 seconds to tell you why I called or, Hey, did I catch you before you went into that meeting? You know, do you have a moment? I just, I think they're very respectful and I get it. And I do think that in a certain scenario, again, picking up an experience, you start to look at your cues when the person answers the phone to where I'm not saying I don't use them, but again, I don't. You've answered the phone. I'm just like, hey, Jason, it's Tom. Uh, just wanted to tell you why I was calling because that's all you care about. You, the first three things that you're trying to do in that 30 seconds with this call is who is it? How do I know them? And do, should we continue this conversation? You do it with your friends. You do it with your family. You do it with all the calls you answer. So I try to get right to that. And then we'll dive into the, you know, now that you know that stuff, may I have 30, you know, may I have a moment to tell you. Um, so I'm not a big fan of permission based. Um, I think, you know, you get it by them picking up the phone. Um, and so just get into it unless like you can tell in the scenario, they're on a plane or something, um, or in a large crowd, right. I'm not going to say I've never said it. You know, if I picked you up and it was super noisy, I'm like, Hey Jay, it's Tom. Uh, sounds like I caught you at a bad minute. Are you all right? And you're like, Oh no, I'm just, you know, running through this, the subway real quick. Oh, okay. Do you have a second? And I can tell you why I called. Right, that's fair, but just a cold call all day asking everybody for their time or do they have permission to hear you out? Why'd you pick up the phone? <laughs> you already are planning to interrupt them, so you did, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have picked up the phone. You would have emailed me and said, Hey, mind if I call you in five minutes? Are you around? Yeah. Could have been a text. Yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. What's really interesting about that is like I've seen similar results in terms of conversion with both approaches. You know, yeah. I think you have to that you're comfortable with. I like using them and teach them. You don't like using them and it like both work. You know what I mean? I think that there's too much of in like what we do too much of you have to do it this way. One thing we both agree on is that you shouldn't fucking pitch yourself in the first 30 seconds. <laughs> Let's be real. That's, that's, you that's it. You don't need any of that yeah. shit, right? Like we don't need your name, your yeah. company. We don't need what your like your value prop yet. Like Let's just have a conversation first, right? That's like walking up to somebody at a bar and trying to get a drink right out, like as soon as you walked in, right? It's like, hey, yeah. slow down, like we talked about, slow down, be confident. It's it's because let's be real, people are just scared of the rejection and they wanna get through it quickly, right? And so they wanna rip the bandaid off, they pitch really fast, they get right into the word vomiting because they're just so scared. And that goes back to that confidence where when you feel good in what you sell, I tell SDRs all the time, if you, the number one thing when picking a company is believe in the space or the tool or the solution. Don't worry about the company, the culture, any of that. First, discover a lane you like to live in. For me, I love SEO. So I worked at GoDaddy, Yelp, brandreputation.com, right? Places that fit that because whether the company or not, I love the ICP. I loved living in those audiences, those communities, because it was shit I enjoyed anyway. So when you can do that, then you're a lot more confident on the phone because it's just a space you love. If you don't like the space, but you're, you know, you love Dooley, but you don't know that space, it's going to be hard for you, right? And you're going to have to learn that. Um, but if you actually knew that space already and you were like, oh, I know Dooley's a superior for that space, like that's why I would go there, then now you can talk to your ICP all day. You can live where they want to live, um, which brings that confidence and, and sets that all up for you. So I try to tell people, believe yeah. in what you want to sell, um, first and foremost, and believe in your ICP. Be one of your ICP. SDR is just a skill set. Your persona every day is, I'm my ICP. I should be at least. I should know it like the back of my hand, what that ICP cares about. I am my buyer persona. 
And then I use my SDR skill set to, to make connections, but I'm not an SDR. I am my ICP. Yeah. I love that. I love that perspective. So let's keep going through the call. So I, how do people, when you say, Hey, the reason for my call is X, Y, Z, you run into these right now, what type of responses will you typically get right there? Uh, so either nothing, right? Like who is this? Um, Hey, I don't have time right now. Most of the time I'll get, Hey, you know, can maybe you send me an email? I don't have a lot of time right now. Um, uh, catch me, you know, tomorrow. Um, or typically I get, you know, yeah, that's one of my buckets. And I get that one extra, you know, conversation in there and they're like, Oh no, Tom, great question. Uh, I'm falling into cold calling problems, right? Awesome. And then we can dive into it. So it kind of can go three different ways. You either get the, Hey, no, the typical, like you just caught him at a bad time to, Hey, I like that. You know, maybe you can call me another time. Uh, maybe send me an email. And then three, they answer it with one of the three options or what I told them. And then we can dive into the call. Yeah. So what are your fees around answering the question? So right when you give that little, Hey, are you dealing with any of these? If someone says, well, hey, who is this again? Or if someone says, what does your company do? What are your philosophies around answering that question? Be honest. No need to beat around it, right? Um, we could play it out, right? You're like, hey, Tom, that, you know, uh, real quick, you know, what's your name? Or, you know, hey, yeah, no, uh, sorry about that. It's Tom. I'm with Trainio. Uh, I was calling because I had seen your post around cold calling. And I talked to a lot of directors like you. And typically, they fall into one of those three things that I had mentioned to you. So I was just reaching out to see if maybe there could be a way we could work together. I'm not sure. You're not sure. Uh, but I was hoping to discuss it with you. It's now not a good time. So you and explained, like, I'm really big on this too. It sounds like you explained what you do through the lens of the customer. Yeah. yeah. Or it's like, yeah, what we do is people like you come to us t- to solve these three kinds of problems. You're not like saying we do this. You know, no. I think that's yeah. so, so important because as soon as you do, oh yeah, we're a platform that does, they're like, yeah, we already got one of those. As soon as you start talking about what you do, people are thinking about, do I do this yet? Do I have a thing that helps with this yet? Et cetera. Yep. I think it's a really super important nuance. So who is this? Yeah, you focus you on about? the problem, right? You focus back yep. on the problem because they can't argue that part, right? Because like, if I give out what I do and all of that, you're right. They're either going to fight or flight, right? And if it's easy to flight out, they're going to be like, oh, I already have that tool. Thanks so much. And you already shot yourself in the foot putting yourself out there and what you, what your play is. Right. So instead it's just like, talk to them as them. Oh, Hey, Jay, great question. It's Tom. I'm over at train you typical people I'm talking with is helping them find great recruits to put themselves, you know, ahead in the, uh, the rat race for good quality candidates. Right. Typically they find that one, two or three is the issue they find. So that's why I was hoping we could chat, you know, it's now not a good time. And then we get right back onto that. And it's not this whole value prop or, it's a value prop, but in a different way that makes it, again, what's in it for me? Nobody cares about my agenda on the cold call. They don't care what my goals are. They don't care that my family needs to eat if I book these meetings or not. They have no idea if I'm one away from goal or killing it that month, right? They care about in this 15 second conversation, do we continue this or not? And how is it a value to me? So every sentence I try to do is explain what's in it for them. What's in it for me, Tom? You know, because you're sitting there trying to decide, right? You're trying to dictate that. So I need to I, I need to play to that. And so Jay is going to be like, well, damn, he's told me who, who he is. He didn't pitch me like crazy. And he's showing me he knows me at least like, all right, I'm going to give this guy a few more seconds, right? And you keep going versus automatically, like you said, had I said, oh, yeah, we do, you know, we're a sales recruiting. We do this. We're a platform. You'd be like, all right, dude, see you later. Thanks. I have one of those. Yeah. Way different. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I'm harping on this so much because that's the resistance I get in training engagements when the, when I first suggest this, that, Hey, we're going to make a cold call without pitching. I'm going to show you how to get meetings without having to pitch. People are like, wait, what? And it's uncomfortable (laughs) for them to not talk about what their thing does. And they feel it's misleading. I was like, I was like, you realize when you say we're a, this and that platform, if the prospect doesn't know what it is, you realize that's just complete gibberish. And it sounds like parents talking in Charlie Brown. You know what I mean? Like they, they don't know anything about any of that kind of stuff, you know? Right. The universal language we have with our buyers is like problems, like outcomes and problems, you know? Um, Find that relatability, so, right? I focus on the yeah. three R's and all of my script building, right? Is research, relevancy, and relatability. I call it the three R's, right? You can't lose a cold call or a cold email or any type of touch 
if you focus on those three pillars. You just can't, right? When you show your research, you're super relevant and you're showing that relatability, find that common ground, right? With the person on the call, either because you know their space, they, you know their buyer persona, you know their challenges, you're the expert. Like Jay, you probably talk to more VPs of sales and directors than a, a VP at an actual company, right? Because that's what you do for a living. You're the domain yep. expert just because you're speaking, you know, let's say you make 300 dials for the whole week, 50 a day or whatnot. You're talking to five, 10 directors a day, getting their feedback, hearing objections, talking to them, understanding their pains, getting some to open up more to you than others. And all of that ammo now allows you to go to the next call even that much better. And you can come in with that confidence of, I've done my research here, Jay. You're struggling in cold calls. You're like every other director that I talk to. And I, I talked to quite a few. You only talk to your internal team and what you know internally, but I'm talking to people in Israel. I'm talking to people in Florida. I'm talking to people up in New York in, in all kinds of industries. I have some cool tips for you if you're open to them uh, that I'd love to share with you because I have the time and effort to go out there and get that info and be bringing that back to you. And that's why I interrupted you today. I apologize. I know it's a cold call, but I interrupted you, right? And here's why. So I showed my research. I showed my relevancy. And now I'm showing that relatability to you. And you're like, damn, all right, Jay, you got my attention. You know, let's book some time. Yeah, I love that, dude. So, okay. So let's say you do those and the prospect says none of that relates with them. How do you respond to that typically? <laughs> uh, my camera froze. Um, if they, none of it relevates, I, I make yeah. humor, right? I, I do the self deprecate a little bit. I try to make them feel good. And I'm like, ah, completely missed the mark on that one, Jay. It looks like my data providers are out of date and I got some issues in the systems. Um, it's ironic though, because I'm looking right at your LinkedIn right now and it does show you're the director over there. Is that accurate or did you just forget to update that? And like kind of play it out, right? If I have that ammo, because it's like, again, if you did your research, then that shouldn't be a response you're getting. Now, if you're doing the buyer persona thing and you can't research, right, then you just be like, oh, my apologies. You know, I apologize. I missed the wrong, wrong person here. Out of curiosity, if maybe you can help me out, you know, who could I speak to? Or do you know of, you know, somebody that would be better fit to talk to? I could really appreciate yeah. the help and come from the help mentality. People love to help. Again, that commonality that you can drive on is people do love to help. They like to be feel celebrated. They want to help the next person. So put that back on them, right? You know, Jay, I apologize. You're not the director. You're not dealing with this challenge. Uh, completely missed the mark. Out of curiosity, why I do have you, you know, do you know who I could speak to? And then here's a small tactic I use, and this could be the, the gurus could come for me in my inbox, but I lead with names sometimes. And sometimes I will make up a name just to get them to caught up to give me the right name. Hey, Jay, I know I reached you. You're not the right person. I apologize for missing the mark there. Um, out of curiosity, maybe you could do, you could help me out. Is it Jill over there or Sarah that I should talk to? Well, Tom, I don't know who either of those are, uh, but it would actually be, you know, Michael. Ha ah, Okay, cool. Gosh, I got a really bad updated system here. <laughs> Thanks so much. Right. I'll go, I'll go talk to Michael. Um, and I yeah. assume with the same domain name, uh, like your email I have for you, is that Michael at blah, blah, blah. Again, they will either correct me or verify. Now I can end that call and cool, close them out. But now I know I need to go after Michael and I've got an email address or a cell number. And again, I'll make up the cell number. Hey, I got Jason's mobile number as, and sometimes I'll mess, if I do know I have the valid mobile number, I'll mess up the last digit and say, hey, I got Jason's number as 480-295-0574. Uh, actually, Tom, it's 0572. Ah, perfect. Thank you so much. I'll update that. Uh, appreciate it. I'll give him a call. Right. So I try to build that um, with a little bit of gaming to it. So I'll try to lead with some names, um, do my research again and be like, oh, OK, since it wasn't you, I have you know a few other contacts in here. Could you just help verify if you got a moment? Is it uh, Sarah or Jill? I've got both of them here, uh, director and you know manager. Oh, it'd be Sarah. Don't bother Michelle. She's not going to want to take that call. OK, perfect. I'll go talk to Sarah. Mind if I inch, you know, let her know you sent me your way or do you want to not let her know that, you know, you wanted to send her my way and you sent the hounds to her and they'd be like, oh, you could tell her it's OK. Right. So that's how I played through some of those scenarios with a couple of little little tactics in there, the ways that I would handle it. Yeah, that's clever. I never thought of just throwing out random names. <laughs> it's not my proudest moment, Jay. I'm not going to lie. Like I said, the people could come out from me in the inbox and I'm OK with it. Uh, but it has worked wonders for me because it just gets people to, people love to correct also, 
right? If I called yeah. you and I told you a wrong name on your team, you're going to correct me, right? You're just going to. Yeah. Um, you're like, no, it's not that person you want to talk, you know? And some don't help you. They just hang up as you're asking that, right? Let's be real. Some will just bail out and that's okay. Um, you can send a follow-up email with that same script. Jay, I know we got cut off there shortly. I apologize for missing the mark with you today and I, I didn't have the data right. Just wanted to reach out so I don't blow up your whole team. Um, it would really be beneficial if maybe you could help me find the appropriate person. Is it Jill or Sarah or do you mind just telling me who it is, right? Either one and then send that email and one out of five times you'll get them to respond and still want to help you, right? And accept that truth with you and you could close it out. So let's say prospect says, yeah, number one is that, the, yeah, I'm definitely focused on that thing. Where do you take the conversation next? Depends on what I'm selling, right? Because I want to go deeper. I need to qualify, right? I need to get into that qualification process. It's not bant, but it's obviously trying to hit those heads, right? Like, did I do the right research? Is this person, you know, the right authority? Um, are they, do they have the accurate need? And when is their, you know, implementation date? When's their I date that they want to aim for solving this problem, right? So, Jay, it's Tom. Uh, reason for my call is I saw your post about some cold call reluctance and how you're fearful of that. Obviously, I talk to a lot of cold callers just like you. They typically are either fearful because they're not set up by their team, they don't have the right ICP they're going after, and their data is wrong, or you know they're uh, just scared to make the activity. You know, where do you find yourself? Oh, you know, for me, it's really you know doing the list, right? I don't have a great list. We're just kind of throwing a big net out there um, and hoping for the best. My team, my my company hasn't really set me up. You know, you're right. Verify again, right? Acknowledge. I got taught when I did for-profit education, uh, when I sold admissions and cold called people on an automated system and cold sold them on, you know, filling out forms to uh, go to college. Remember when you do gated content and had to fill out if you wanted to go to college to get to the next piece on like Career Builder and some of those sites? Yeah. I'd call those people. And the process they taught us was uh, Crab Wa, Crab Wa, W A. And it was clarify, reflect, ask, benefit statement with them and then acknowledge uh, or no yeah something like that to where you qualified you reflected you uh, acknowledged and then you did the benefit statement and then you did the with them and then you did the uh the uh like acquire next steps right close it out and move uh pivot to the next thing so long ago but it stuck with me because of the with them right providing what's in it for me um and then clarifying and reflecting so once they give me that first answer now I'm clarifying. Totally figured that was probably where you were seeing that, Jay, uh, you know, making those lists. Some of the directors I've talked to, it's just been hard, right? They don't know how to identify that ICP um, and are struggling to find where to, to get that list. Up until this point, you know, how have you been overcoming that list structure? What have you been trying to do? Because again, I want to find out where they are in the buying cycle or what they have done so I don't have to waste my time or theirs, you know, because sometimes you just assume. Oh, you have problems with that. Here's how we do it. Da, 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 da. And they're like, hey, dude, I've done all of that, right? I've checked out that tool. I've seen it. And you're like, well, okay, I don't have anything else. All right, bye. Right? So stop, right? Just bring out some things and ask them where they're at. All right, Jay, you're having some list issues. I'm out of curiosity. What have you been trying to do to overcome that? Do you know about some of the lead tools out there? Yeah, yeah, we've done, you know, this one, that one. Okay. And again, we're just talking and I'm just kind of not making it an interrogation. It needs to be conversational, but I'm trying to get to the deep root until I can find that problem that resonates directly with me where I can know that I can go in and go for the, the ask, right? Or just find out if there's a real true need here. Because if they're like doing all this stuff and they're good, then it's like, all right, so, you know, it sounds like you're doing all these right things. Where do you feel the roadblock is? Well, I think it's, you know, this. Perfect. We actually solved that. That's why I was reaching out. I appreciate you giving me the ammo that we discussed, right? And now let's secure next steps and determine what that would look like. Um, so I go through that clarify, that reflect, that with them, kind of walk them through that um, and try to dig deeper until I can find that exact problem I can go in for the kill um, and ask for that meeting. Yeah. And a lot of this requires you to have a really good acumen around this, you know? Being your ICP. Very, yeah. Right? It's, it's being your ICP person. because you know... You're a cold cool caller. You could talk to all these SDR. Dude, an SDR on a phone call with you, you can jam all day on that. You don't have to pre-script anything. You don't need to know anything. You could probably talk to an SDR and anything they threw at you, you could dive deeper to and at least find a solution to help them, right? But that's because you live in it. That's your space, right? Same with me. 
So you've got to immerse yourself in your ICP and become that when you work there because you want to just be conversational. And the way to be conversational is when you know that world and you can be that expert. We all have that one friend in the group that they're a know-it-all. They know everything to every answer, right? And they're always on top of it. Um, and you always laugh at them, right? Because they're always like, oh yeah, I know that one. Um, but you want to be that, right? You want to be the know-it-all in your space. That's why you want to find a space that makes sense to you um, and, and do that. Because then these nuances don't bother you because it's just talking to a friend about a TV show that you've watched. You know, we could talk about a TV show we both saw. Why? Because we've, we've, we've watched the whole thing. We know it. We've studied it, right? Um, so you need to be that way with your prospects. I love it, dude. Well, this has been a great conversation, man. I want to save a little bit of time here. I got some rapid fire questions for you. Ready? Oh, no. Uh-oh. Oh, okay. First thing that comes to mind. All right. Short, sweet. Let's do it. <laughs> so if you had to choose between phone, email, and social for prospecting, uh, what do you pick and why? I'm picking the phone all day. Reason why is it's faster, speed to lead, uh, more conversational. I can have a voice with somebody and connect on a whole different level uh, than just going through a, a text transaction and email or social selling. Um, and end of the day, I've never seen a deal be closed or sold without a, co a call made in that cycle. Nobody's closed via social selling or email. It's always led to the phone. Um, so that is my answer. What is something you believe about sales that most would disagree with? What we talked about, you can, you can cold call without pitching. You can cold call and sell without pitching. If you're selling, you're doing it wrong, right? Instead of pushing people into your pipeline or, you know, pushing people into your pipeline, pull them in. So I think that's a big myth is everybody thinks we have to constantly be pitching in every interaction with these prospects when I don't believe you have to. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to still sell without ever pitching anything. And we covered a few of those today. Um, so hopefully the listeners will see that, that you don't have to pitch in your cold calls all the time. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to yourself as a rookie sales professional? Breathe. Stop stressing. Stop overthinking everything. Uh, lock down your foundational processes. Get your metrics. Get yourself locked in on the basics before you start getting creative and swinging for the fences, right? It's like baseball. I would tell myself, just get on base. One, one base at a time. Stop swinging so hard for the home runs on everything you do. Just get on base, move the conversation in some piece, leave the account better than you left it. And if you focus on that, then, you know, you're good to go. Leave the account better than you found it is what I mean, not left. <laughs> but that's what I would say to myself. Good stuff, man. Before you take off, let us know where can we connect with you, learn more about what you're doing, all that good stuff. Uh, LinkedIn is my, my channel. Uh, come find me on the LinkedIn, Tom Slocum with a fire emoji in front of my name. Um, I'm a DM away, always accessible. You can find me in some major communities out in the space. Um, and then just a small plug, right? That I'm VP of sales over at Trainio. So if you're a company looking to hire some great SDRs, you know, reach out. I would love to show you some candidates that we do have that are going through boot camps, getting all this taught to them. So they are you know, going out to market like this, that the way Jason and I believe, right, where they can go out and build true relationships and be, you know, a, a good source of revenue for you. 